All right, face to face. Hey, welcome to Speechless. We're glad to have you on today. And we will be discussing uh, three issues. And one is the Little Canada case where a U.S. citizen using his constitutional rights videotaped an arrest, which turned out to be a medical emergency and a police officer came over, a deputy came over and said, turn off the camera. He refused, and he was arrested for disorderly conduct. And uh, one other issue, which we will talk about later today, um, tonight. So, uh, and at Judge Edward Wilson in Ramsey County issued an order, a, a pretrial hearing, a uh, motion to suppress or dismiss, and uh, he did not dismiss for various reasons, and we're going to discuss some of those. So um, is Judge Edward Wilson correct in his decision-making here? I don't believe so. I, I think he's just uh, should have dismissed the case. It shouldn't be brought, and the people in Little Canada, it's going to cost you a lot of money uh, for defending. There's the Judge Edward Wilson there. Okay, uh, the, ex the other thing we're going to talk about is the uh, parental rights constitution, not constitutional amendment, but what's happening is there's a UN treaty on the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. And in that treaty, it will take away your parental rights. Uh, um, and the UN will be telling the United States how parents are to behave which is totally against the principles of our country. And, but the effort and the push is going to go on in the Senate to get this treaty ratified. It was defeated once. You have to have a two-thirds majority. It did not take place. It was a close vote. Um, but it's going to be tried again, and it's going to be used as a political weapon. But what is not being said is your parental rights are being taken away in this process. Uh, and then we're going to talk about uh, Ray, also Ray Woodstrand, who is an employee of SCC, uh, Suburban Cable Communication, is where this show comes out of, uh, who was beaten, up, beaten on the east side and his recovery. And there was a um, city meeting uh, on the east side at Arlington uh, Hills Lutheran Church to basically informed the people of what was taking place in this uh, case and what the police in the city are planning to do to stop this type of violence going forward and what's happened in the past. So some good video there. Uh, we're going to discuss those three things. But I also want to let you know what's coming up in the following weeks. This week was supposed to be Common Core and things didn't work out again about the Common Core curriculum. but. Uh, hopefully next week we will have uh, Marjorie Holston on who will give a history of our education system and how our education system is trying to be nationalized instead of being a federal education system uh, where states determine the education role the national government's trying to overtake it the education and uh, use their propaganda that so it's one propaganda in all 50 states and it's had many many names and even the Republicans uh, presidents have pushed it but right now it's called common core is what they're pushing for and of course when you use the word common uh, race to the top where any the national government is telling local government what's best for their students for their citizens we got a problem uh, and that's what's happening uh, right now. So next week, uh, hopefully, discussion on that. Also coming up will be uh, Andy Selig with the Minnesota Voter Alliance. They've had a number of federal lawsuits regarding voting rights in Minnesota, and the state court and federal courts are now conflicting, and the federal court came down with a ruling that uh, is conflicting with the state. Basically, what's happened is uh, our state courts have ruled that, my understanding is that the state courts have ruled that the Minnesota Constitution is unconstitutional regarding guardianships. So um, the federal Constitution says that Minnesotans, anybody that's a U.S. citizen, has the right to vote. And in order to take away a right, you have to have due process. But our Minnesota Constitution says if you are under guardianship, you don't have the right to vote. 
which is a, subs, is a lack of due process because you can have full mental capacity but be under guardianship because you don't have physical capabilities and then you've just lost your right to vote. And so uh, we're going to discuss the whole process that's taking place, what's taking place in our courts and how people with the right to vote are not being able to vote. And then people that shouldn't have the right to vote are getting to vote. So it's, uh, it's a fascinating discussion. So that hopefully coming up in a couple of weeks. And then also, uh, Greg Wurzel uh, will be looking on coming on the show. He's ran for the Minnesota Supreme Court. And we're going to be talking about your right to elect judges under our Minnesota Constitution and the effort and the push to take away this constitutional uh, right and the effort to just have judges appointed. So where we have a judicial oligarchy of an elite system of highly intellectual people in their own mind um, would make the decision on who's our judges and then we would have no accountability. That's my spin on it and I believe that to be the case. So anyway, um, that's what's coming up and what's going on uh, in the show. So let's get into this uh, little Canada case. So you're outside, you're on your property, you're out where you're living, and uh, all of a sudden an ambulance shows up and uh, the police show up and they bring a man out of their, uh, his apartment and they're out front in the street and they police start frisking him and uh, uh, placing him in handcuffs. Have you seen that picture on TV at all? Have you seen that before? Well, yeah, you see that all the time. Uh, that is uh, space open to the public. It's not private property. It's open to the public. Uh, once you're out in the open, you're out in the open. Anybody can film you and do what they want to do. You know, paparazzis, you know, they do it all the time. They do get in trouble when they violate somebody's constitutional rights. So this man in Little Canada films this, what looks like to be an arrest. And which is perfectly correct for him to do, but the sheriff, a deputy, comes over and says, you turn off that camera. And actually, <clears throat> uh, she said, uh, told him to put the camera down, and if I end up on YouTube, I'm going to be upset. Now, we're in the process of trying to get this video and this audio uh, to play it on here, and eventually it will be up on YouTube, so I might upset her. Uh, however, too bad. Uh, you know, so this man says, uh, I have a right to do this. And this was Deputy uh, Molnar. Um, uh, I got the first name here. Jacqueline Molnar um, uh, told this to, to the man. And she's been, uh, she retired now after 33 years uh, with the Sheriff's Department. So or, or Little Canada, I don't know uh, whether she was Little Canada or the Sheriff's Department for uh, Ramsey County, I don't know. But either way, the city is prosecuting this man. And he's being charged with disorderly conduct and interfering with an ambulance crew. Okay, that's interesting. Disorderly conduct and interfering with an ambulance crew, and he's just standing 30 feet away filming. Now, they're going to say he was within five feet uh, filming, um, but they're, they're, I, I, don't, I don't believe they have any evidence for, for this. So he's being charged with these crimes. And, of course, let's, let's uh, consider what disorderly conduct is. Offensive, obscene, abusive, boisterous, or noisy conduct that the actor knows or has reason to know would tend to alarm, anger, or disturb others or provoke an assault or breach of peace. Okay, and um, this is what needs to be discovered. Now, if, they, if the deputy is coming over and saying, uh, stop filming, and he, that's all he's doing, which is, all the evidence so far suggests, she's out of order. Okay, she's violating his constitutional rights. He has a right to defend his constitutional rights. Um, now, he wasn't uh, doing anything to incite the officer and for the officer to arrest him. He was just filming. 
And one of the ambulance drivers was disturbed that he was filming uh, and mentioned it to the, uh, the deputy. Well, so what if he's disturbed that it, they're being filmed? It ended up being a medical emergency in this case, and so uh, interfering with an ambulance crew. Well, how is filming an ambulance crew interfering with an ambulance crew? You see that happen all the time on the news. The ambulance is in the background or in the foreground. They're taking a person. There's no right to privacy if it's out in the public. But because the deputy escalated it and he said, no, I'm not going to, then they're coming after him. So that's what's going on. And so as a rightful defense, the, uh, his name is Andrew Henderson, put in a, uh, a motion to uh, dismiss the charges, which a judge can decide on, uh, according to our law. And this was Edward Wilson. And uh, here's what Edward Wilson, Judge Edward Wilson of Ramsey County said. And if you can put his graphic up any time, his picture up again. Uh, he cannot be shielded. Andrew Henderson cannot be shielded under the cloak of the First Amendment. And that's exactly right. In other, what I understand him saying is that you can't scream fire in a movie theater when there's no fire because you're going to incite a riot, that type of thing. Okay, So you can't say, I have free speech rights, I have the freedom to film this uh, because he does blogging, he's part of the press or whatever. I have freedom of the press, I have free speech rights. Um, you can't charge me with this crime because I was doing what was in my constitutional rights. Well, you can do what's in your constitutional rights for free speech, but we also have laws against slander. You can't lie. You can't lie against somebody purposefully and knowingly. So there's where the kind of situation where you just can't say whatever you want. Matter of fact, swearing in public is a disorderly conduct. It is not protected by the Constitution or the law. It's not a free speech right because you have the right to peacefully assemble. When you're doing things that aren't peacefully, then you don't have that right. So Ed, Judge Wilson is correct. He can't be shielded under the cloak of the First Amendment for a behavior that may be unconstitutional may violate somebody's under other constitutional amendment uh, rights. But in this case, what did he do to violate somebody else's constitutional right? That's, that's the question. Okay, so, so far in this story, it's just a, a deputy not liking that he's filming something he has the right to film. Or does he have the right to film it? Okay, so the judge uh, also goes on to say, it is not necessary that one engage in a physical act to interfere or obstruct. I, I, you know, that's reasonable. Uh, you can just be standing there yelling, harassing, waving, uh, and, and obstructing. Now, is filming something, does that raise to the level of interference or obstruction? Are you getting in the way of the people doing their job uh, by your filming? Are you blocking them? Of course, there still would have to be intent in this, but all the evidence so far is showing, no, he, he wasn't in that area. He wasn't around them. He was far enough away, 30 feet, uh, more than plenty of room to do their job in filming. Um, so, and, and so the judge is correct in what he's saying, but does it apply? And that's what the judge was to determine in this case. Was there enough evidence to show that he was interfering or obstructing? And then the judge goes on to, uh, Judge Edward Wilson says, it is sufficient if the defendant's action or conduct had the effect of physically obstructing or interfering with a member of an ambulance crew. So that was one of the charges, interfering with a member of the ambulance crew. Okay, and, but did they provide evidence that he had done that? 
they have the film. They, they can show that, whether he was or not. And so, but, but the whole thing is that he wasn't. It was the deputy that was creating the scene, and it was the ambulance crew that was creating the scene. If they would have just done their job, and this guy was far enough away filming that he wasn't interfering with anything. He wasn't in the line of path. He wasn't, you know, what was going on here? So the judge is playing a line here. What he's saying is true, but does it apply? Okay, now, so the judge in his assessment was ruling that the recording of a medical assessment by paramedics in Henderson's, in Andrew Henderson's case is not constitutionally protected speech. But he doesn't say why. And he says that is different from other cases in which a defendant videotapes police carrying out their duties. So they're not getting him on him videotaping the police, handcuffing him, but it is getting them on the ambulance carrying out their duties. And that's not protected speech. You know what? That's, you know, that's a bunch of baloney. You know, he, he, the judge here is saying that he didn't do anything to um, interfere with the crew. The judge here is implying, in, and it's going to be interesting to see what evidence gets before that jury if there's jury instructions. If this judge is given this kind of jury instructions uh, in this case, that, um, that filming medical assessments by paramedics out in the public is not constitutionally protected speech. If the judge is saying that, he's dead wrong. Anything out in the public is uh, to be filmed uh, is, is a free speech right. So it will be interesting, that case, uh, to see what it goes forward here. But Little Canada, you're going to pay for it. You're going to pay big time. They should drop this case. Uh, of course, the, the deputy, Jacqueline Molnar, retired, and she may have a great history uh, in the past, but it's just like somebody who's never murdered before, a great, decent person, but now they murder. You know, now they commit the crime. Well, do we still punish them? We don't go by their past and say, boy, this is a really good person all their life. But now they intentionally killed somebody, you know, uh, murdered somebody. There's a difference between killing and murdering somebody. They intentionally murdered somebody. Well, we throw them in jail for life, you know, if they're, if they're convicted. But if a police officer has a great record or a sheriff has a great record, all their life, uh, and then violate somebody's constitutional right once, you know, that's a blot on their record. And, of course, uh, Jacqueline Molnar had the option to retire and did, but she should be, this should be looked at as whether she should be prosecuted or sued for violating this person's. I hope they're going to do that in this case. I, 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 you know, you know, I don't like those things, but... Somebody has to hold our government accountable, and this Andrew Henderson is in the spot to do that, and hopefully he's getting legal help to do it. It looks like he is. All right, we have a caller on the line. Uh, caller, do you have a comment or question? Tim Kinley. Yes. Thanks for bringing this huge issue up on your show. I'm, uh, I've picked up the paper and read that. I uh, couldn't make much of what they were saying in the paper, but it did sound like the judge made it, like you said, a poor decision, poorly thought out, poorly argued, tried to think he had some sort of, you know, fringe way to uh, twist it. Yeah. So he didn't have to protect somebody's constitutional rights and he could uh, be ambiguous. And, of course, right. the sad, disfortunate, tragic part of the situation, the burden has been on somebody who is a law-abiding citizen, you know, doing a civic duty and uh, uh, serving this community, and now the burden is on that person, and that is sad because it's a big expense, it's a lot of complication, and uh, like you said, shame on Little Canada for pursuing this. It's, uh, it's, a, it's, it's, it's going to put a lot of burden on this individual when he should be treated as a hero because he went the extra effort. And now with the government surveil surveillance, you know, surveilling everything, the cameras all over, uh, surveilling Internet, phone calls, uh, 
kept invading everybody's privacy in all kinds of uh, multitude of ways. And some guy serving his community takes a camera out there, and they jump on him like a bunch of uh, gorillas yeah. and rats and force them in the corner, and the judge doesn't put a stop to it. That's a sad situation. Well, and, I mean, that's a great, that's a huge point, and it leads right into the next part. What if there was a change in circumstances? What if this guy who had an alcohol level of point, uh, three two, uh all of a sudden started beating up on the police, beating up on the medical emergency people, and uh, banished a gun. Of course, the police officer searched him first. What, what if before that, they, the police got to do the search, the guy banished a gun and pointed at the police officer, and the police shot him dead? That video would exonerate the police officers. So he was there protecting them, and they turned it around and abused him. And it's protecting yeah. the ambulance drivers for false allegations that may have come up, uh, uh, you know, for, for that man saying, you stole this, you did this, why I was in this state, you beat me up. You know, so because that camera was there, that camera protected the police officers. And this is why I so much want cameras in our courtrooms, because judges get falsely accused of things. They get, they, I think you're, you know, you're right so it protects, us, the, protects the judges. Because you're right. Yeah. And they should, and I agree, they should be in the courtrooms because uh, it, it protects everybody, but it generally protects the weakest party because the weakest party, the less unfortunate party, generally hasn't, doesn't have the money or the educational know-how or the connection to the system to preserve his constitutional rights. The constitutional rights in America should be more than just for the uh, very wealthy or the people with uh, connections. Uh, and, and unfortunately, everything in this country is <laughs> being turned around. That the, the only way you get your constitutional rights in this country is if you can pay for your constitutional rights, and that's something that's supposed to be God-given and free. The, yeah. the other thing is, I'm, I got a comment on that issue. You hope as soon as the uh, you know the city is all they're doing. The problem with that, of course, would be a suit in the federal court because that's a constitutional issue. We know that all the federal judges aren't term limited, so they, uh, you know, we know that uh, they're most of them are pretty much in the bag of the government because you know the checks come from the government, uh, uh, in the federal government. And so, uh, good luck that uh, federal judges ever going <laughs> to. I mean, very seldom well, they're highly publicized when the federal judge actually uh, rules on the side of the uh, citizen. Yes. <laughs> against the government. I mean, it's always it's always good to see, and I know the media makes that in a row heroic uh, as if it's happening every day, but it doesn't happen. And again, again, to sue the government and then go into the federal government courts and try to prove your, prove your search again. You have yeah. the heavy burden on heavy, you, heavy. and you have to win it 15 times and make it so obvious before you'll... Right. And I, I think that's the way the government looks at it, too. Uh, oh, absolutely. You know, you know. Yeah, de so definitely that's the way to look at it. Yeah, very good. And your, and your point about the weakest party, it protects the weakest party. We don't know who the weakest party is going to be. In right. these situations, we don't know. The weakest party may be the judge. The weakest party may be the, the police officer. The weakest party may be right. the citizen. We don't know who it will be until charges are brought out. And if it's video recorded, we have a lot better idea of who the weaker party is. Oh, no. I, and, and, I, and I know so that the government, in gen, the government in general is really not happy about all these. Uh, you know, Silicon Valley and all their cameras and all that, and everybody were walking around with cameras in their pocket on their phones. And they, you know, the government just definitely wants to find, in my mind, uh, would like to find a way to clamp down on it, just like they clamped down in Minnesota last year when they, they uh, it used to be that if you wanted to get the emails that the government uh, is passing out. Right. Yeah. All right. Are you kind of breaking up there, so it's a little hard to hear you. So, all right. Um, thank you, caller. And, you know, the, the big question, can you charge somebody for malicious prosecution? Malicious charging, I should say. Um, you know, and, th and that happens. Of course, that's what they say. Well, it's just part of the negotiation process. You know, we get plea deals and just saves everybody time and money. Um, 
Well, does it, you know, I mean, it's, it's a racket, definitely. Uh, but, you know, there are honest people in the system that try to do a good job. I've met many of them. Uh, but then there are those that are just, you know, jerks, and they're going to do what they want because they want to. All right, let's get into uh, Ray Woodstrand's uh, situation. He's the man that was beat up on the east side and um, uh, is an employee of the suburban community cable um, where this show is, is uh, broadcast. But there was a, and, and just an update on him, um, he's in a lot of therapy, is not talking, uh, but is engaging in uh, physical activity. They're trying to get speech, they're going to get speech therapists in there. And he's improving on a daily basis, which is a good thing, but it is a long road that he's headed down. Um, in his recovery and I've just been praying for Ray and people keep your praise, prayers up and uh, it's you know it's tending toward the positive but in these type of situations with brain injuries and other physical injuries uh, it could just turn on a dime very very quickly uh, but the, the issue and so I just very thankful for that he is on the path of recovering and and doing better but in no ways out of the woods and uh, in regards to that for some reason this beating that took place has gotten the residents of East St. Paul uh, very very upset and and not only at because of the beating and the way in which the beating took place by gang members Two women starting out in a fight, and this is kind. Of, this is really an unsaid part of this. They're they're talking. A lot of people are talking about the men uh, that beat up Ray. Uh, that it was a a racial crime, and it very well could be. And I tend to believe it was. If he was another black man in the area, I don't think he would have been beaten up. But because he was white, I think he was targeted, and and beat up. Um, that being said, this whole thing started because of violence between two women. Gang members were there. They did their tweeting. A couple women are going to be fighting. Everybody starts showing up. Okay, raise an innocent bystander walking by. Right when the fight breaks out, two women fighting. Now, of course, if you if you believe the domestic violence industry or the, uh, the those that are against violence and who isn't against violence, women don't commit violence. Okay, that's their motto. That's what they want to put in your mind and have put in your mind that that women do not create this type of violence. That it's against them to do that. But that's what started the fight. Where is the outcry and where is the talking about women committing violence? The studies are there, but the political parties, and I'm going to say on the DFL side, or the DL side, because they're no longer in favor of farmers, the DL side is covering up domestic violence against, uh, against men and covering up the aspect that women commit violence just as often and just as violently as men do. And here, these two women, are there going to be charges for them? Because they helped to incite the riot that took place in the beating. If they wouldn't have gotten a fight, would Ray be okay now? Would that have not happened? They should be charged for their disorderly conduct. But we don't hear that taking place. There's no mention of that, and it's being ignored. I don't know why, except for the atmosphere that we have in our culture that women don't abuse, even though the number one abuser of children is women. And somehow that's okay. Okay, we don't talk about that. You see it in the press. I mean, they, they cover when women abuse, but they don't cover the statistics that they abuse a lot. Bureau of Criminal Apprehension in Minnesota, the studies come out, there was at least one done. After that, they stopped the studies. Uh, well, I don't know if they stopped them. I haven't found out other studies. They may be out there that women abuse children more than men do. But what, where, where's the outcry? Where it's, oh, we can't have violence against 
uh, women and children, but it's the men that are doing it, not the women. That's the implication. All right. Uh, so that is something that needs to be brought up in Ray's case. So um, let's, uh, let's go to the first video. This is at the um, Arlington Hills Lutheran Church. And let's go hear uh, this first uh, woman uh, speak and hear what she has to say. My name is Danette. Um, I'll raise my lip. Al, Berkeley, could you ask people to maybe quiet it down so people can be heard? Yeah, uh, Danette has the next question. Danette is uh, active in the Westminster Case uh, Block Club, and I appreciate her asking the next question. Yeah, I haven't heard it. Um, now, I, so I live on Case. I live in the Lower East Side of St. Paul. I've lived there 13 years. Um, I love my neighborhood. I think it's awesome. I... I love everything about the east side except the crime. Um, I have a child care business in my home, so I have a double effort to keep things safe and report and call on everything. And my thing is, well, I have to drive up case, say we go to the YMCA, and there is a section, and you guys um, referred to it, but um, between Payne and Edgerton on case, um, past the Wilder um, Park, there is... Diane was just talking about it, the woman who said these people camp out on her um, her porch. I took the number down on the way here, 594 and 588 case. She lives at 594. These aren't drug dealers in her porch. They are just people that are loitering. I have reported it. I put it on the Facebook Eastside Facebook page. I have called District 5. I've called the police the, at 588, and I'm sorry if anybody lives there, but it's a drug house, and it's like constant. What I'm... I don't understand how somebody can rent a home, you buy a home, invest, where are the landlords? Why aren't they being held responsible? Yeah. All right, before the mayor uh, Coleman says anything here in his response, I just have to say this, where are the landlords? Uh, in this is totally wrong okay you cannot charge somebody for somebody else's actions if the landlords are committing a crime and renting out your property is not a crime okay they're following the rules uh, they get to rent out their own it's their own property they get to rent it out you can't charge somebody with a crime for somebody else's behavior a third party uh, does a crime and it's the landlord's fault or the people in the in the building they I mean the landlords do have a say they can say well you know based on your behavior uh, I need to let you go but try that in a lawsuit look how are they going to be protected they're going to have to go take that person to court and to kick them out you know it, they got to be arrested by the police first in order for a landlord to have any luck in kicking anybody out of their property, especially if they're paying the rent. And there was a landlord there who said he kicked 30 kids out of his property alone. Okay, so they're there, uh, and the landlord may be removing, uh, they're removing people, uh, but they just keep coming back. Um, so it... And we're going to hear this next guy speak. Well, first of all, we're going to hear what Coleman has to say. But this whole, and there was kind of a mob mentality. If somebody said something to blame something on somebody else, uh, rather than the own, own individual's behavior and the lack of the police response to it, which became a big issue in this hearing, what are the police doing? Uh, because people are being arrested, but they're being let go. Yeah, bail and all that, but are the charges coming? You know, there needs to be more cameras. These citizens need to get a camera and record what's going on. But uh, anyway, let's hear what Mayor Coleman has to say in response to this. <laughs> no, I, I appreciate it, but I, I do want to say, because other uh, people may not know some of the things that we're doing, particularly to go after problem properties and problem landlords, we do have our folks uh, from inspections here. Uh, several years ago, under the leadership of Councilmember Bostrom and, and Councilmember Lantry, uh, we went to a registration system so that. I'm Fred Moen. Just so I mean, I'm in her she's, yeah. yeah, she wasn't on the council yet, but I know she's. Amy Brennan is. is she's awesome. We love her. 
We all love Amy. But, again, I, I just want to say that we, we're really going after, we're, we're trying to step it up. It's one of the things that we're doing is trying to get out and inspect more of these properties uh, to go after where there's violations, to remove um, the certificate of occupancy when we can do that. If there's, and, it's, and it's not just the active drug dealing, but really going after unsightly conditions. There are a lot of places that we need to, to step up our efforts. But I think it's one of those, you know, the old broken windows theory, which is you, you go after places that, uh, that aren't being cared for, because if they're not being cared for, a lot of bad things that, that can come after that. But that is, uh, you know, to that, uh, your, your participation in the block clubs, a lot of people have come up to you in the last couple of weeks and said, you know, what can we do? Uh, I hope that you're engaged in block clubs. I hope that you're getting to know your neighbors. I hope that you're getting to, to, to let us know and be proactive on that. And, and we're going to continue to work on it. You have, you have a lot of folks in the city. Um, but I wanted, I wanted to say, and, and this is kind of where we need to step it up, because uh, of the challenges that we're seeing right now, on the east side is that I, I want every one of our department directors to put in, you know, to, to really work e extremely hard to go after these properties right now uh, where we're seeing these problems come from. I truly believe that this is a, this is a small handful of, of folks that are causing the biggest problems and if we can if we can get them get the landlords that are allowing it get the get the uh, the families that are watching out for their children as was mentioned earlier um, you know we need to let people know you can either take the the highway uh, and 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 you know go to school and do what you're supposed to do and learn and behave or you're going to go to jail and 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 as a parent you can, we we do have you know we can't. There's not a crime for a parent if your child is misbehaving. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, yeah. Sorry, we have a couple of our legislators here, we might want to, but the, the fact of the matter is we, we are working very hard and we're going to step up those efforts. All right, there, there you heard it again. It's not a crime for a parent based on the behavior of the child, but we're going to go after the landlord. <laughs> You know, you know, he was he was trying to navigate a situation where he didn't need to navigate. He should have just spoke the truth, which was we can't go after a landlord for the behavior of the renter. That's what he should have said. But he he tried to appease one, and since nobody was talking, well, people did talk about uh, ar arresting parents and who's holding the parents accountable. Uh, they did say they did talk about that, but it isn't a. The, the point remains, whether it's a landlord or a parent, if the child, in this case, we've got adults, uh, an adult that participated in this. And, and actually, they weren't even renters. There were loiters. There were people that didn't live on these properties that were doing that. They just gathered in front on the street. And that, see the distortion that's going on here? Um, so that should have been navigated by the mayor, it should have spoke about that instead of problem properties. It's not the properties that are problem, and that's the point, you know, broken windows. A broken window doesn't cause a crime. A broken window may be there because a crime was committed, but then you go after the person, not after the broken window, <laughs> you know? Um, it's the behavior of the person, and, and that people, I'm concerned for people down here on East Side St. Paul that are trying to deflect it into um, these uh, inanimate objects rather than the individual committing the crime. So we're going to inspect property, we're going to do these certificate of occupancies and take away your property rights uh, and take away your property without due process. Uh, that's not the answer. So now, I just before we go to the next video, I'm going to say that I, next Wednesday I am doing Bob Zick's show. Uh, Greg Copeland will be on that on this show. We're going to be showing a lot more of this video, and but it's not just about this situation with Ray Woodstrand. It's also about what's going on in St. Paul with property rights. Somebody just got their property taken away through a condemnation, and people are saying there's nothing wrong with the property. Four uh, inspectors, police officers went in. Uh, to evict the person and they went and looked at the property and they go, what's wrong with it? Why is this place condemned? There was no reason. They wouldn't do it. Somebody else came in. They wouldn't do it because it was wrong. Yet they condemned this property um, there in St. Paul. 
you have an alloyal right to your property. Uh, the city of St. Paul, in this system that we have an inspector of properties, we've got these things. It's a criminal organization in my mind that's taking place. They're taking property for their own benefit. They're not using eminent domain. They're going around the Constitution to violate people's rights in St. Paul. They're the largest landlord, 800 homes St. Paul owns in worse conditions than the homes they're taking, and they're not keeping those homes up, and yet they're going after the citizen. This is a big problem. That's need to stop. Now, you have one of the solutions was from this officer, uh, the Chief Smith was we got 30 officers now ready on call to answer these type of flash gang situations that are taking place. Uh, where did they come from? There just was lack of details in this meeting. Uh, although it was a good meeting to have, people got to vent their concerns. A lot of information was found out. Let's go here, the next uh, uh, person testifying. We all hush down, please. I got something to say. Don't be quiet. Oh, yeah. All right, I live on 713 Magnolia. I'm originally from Brooklyn Park. Moved in with my wife. We've been here for two years. In the two years, my car has been broken into three times. Subwoof was taken once, so I quit playing my music loud. It broke into my car again. Recently, they've been running up on my roof between me and my neighbor's house to the point where there's an indentation on my roof. Now, I'm going to tell you this. I don't expect the cops to do no more than what they're doing because it takes me 30 minutes to get a response anyhow. I'm a registered gun owner. Now, I ain't trying to shoot or kill nobody here. Yeah. Yeah. And the last thing about, I gotta say, it ain't all about violence. Yes, the parents need to be uh, charged for stuff that they're doing, but people gotta take care of their own. You can't depend on nobody else to take care of your kid but you. It takes a village to raise a child, but if parents don't individually take care of this kid, we'll be back here next year talking about the same thing. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> so it's a heated moment. Things are happening. He doesn't like people stealing from him. Go figure. I agree with him. That's a terrible thing. Uh, kids are running on his roof. And so these, and from the testimony that I heard, People are videotaping. These people are being caught in the act. The names are known, and the witnesses are there, and they're not getting charged with the disorderly conduct or trespassing. And it's just, you know, is it running wild down there? Is the wild, wild west in East St. Paul? Um, you know, I don't know, but with all the complaints that these people are talking about, and, and the big thing was is the bad interaction that the police officers have with the people. And, uh, you know, next Wednesday, watch the show um, because we're going to go into a lot more details and parse this out a lot more. But the problem is the individual holding the individual accountable for their behavior. And this man said something that I disagree with, but, I, you know, you kind of know what he's talking about. It takes a village. Well, it takes a family. To raise a child. There needs to be a family there. Of course, the schools, the city, the state, parents don't have the rights to discipline. These kids were over 16 that committed this crime. They have no right to discipline their kids. Uh, the, the police will tell them that. But what if the village is corrupt? What if the family's corrupt? Well, you got to charge them. And so there's a problem. You got to hold the individual accountable for what they're doing. And we have to have people that are willing to do that. And, of course, people have to be vigilant, And we're not. We're not vigilant. We're not holding our elected officials accountable. We're not following up on a case. Take a case. That's what I try to do on this show. Take a case and follow it through. And uh, that gets into another case I need to talk about, the Bergstrom case. Hmm. It's been eight, nine months now. Uh, before the Supreme Court on a constitutional challenge to 50-year restraining orders, all you can hear is the birds chirping. You know, where's the answer to that? Come on, judges. Uh, we deserve better than that. Do your job. Get an answer out there. It's a legitimate question. Uh, so let's hear that answer. We don't need to be waiting nine months for this. You should do what the district court. They, they only got uh, three months, and the appellate court only has three months. So, you know, what are the corrupting influences? Uh, in, in this community and for these children and address it. And of course, some of that corrupting influences is what these kids are taught and, uh, and how they, are, they can get away with their behavior. And some of that is, deals with uh, what's going on in the family. 
So, okay, um, next video here is one of the moms whose children is charged, uh, I believe it's one of the minor children charged uh, with this crime. Uh, you know, the person gets their day in court, but let's hear what the mother has to say. Tina, as you all know, I am the parent of one of the kids that has been charged. And I would like to respond to the comment that the police chief did make. You said, where the heck are the parents? The parents do be at work, which that's where I was when this did take place. I was at work. When I leave my house, my kids are at home. When I'm at work, if my son leaves the house, I don't have no control of that. And at the same time, I've also been a victim of crime in St. Paul, where a person came into my house, took my kids from their bedrooms, locked them in one room, put my mom in another room, locked them in a the room, police came, found the man in my house, all my stuff in his car, and this man was still released. So, yeah, I had a few occasions with St. Paul police. Yeah, they're really rude. Um, they're, oh my God, I don't even want to know where to start, but... <coughs> We sitting here judging, um, y'all say to have respect, they cut sitting here calling these kids hoodlums and all this stuff. Okay, some kids, some kids do fall victim to the wrong, like I say, it's older people out here. It's, in, in this case, it's like a lot of adults that's involved with this stuff that's luring these younger kids. And then, they're luring these younger kids. Like I said, my friends go out to the family, I feel very sorry. If my son did have something to do with this, he will be responsible for his actions, yes. Thank you. We appreciate your being here. Thank you for your presence. All right. She had a lot of good things to say. A uh, couple questions I have is, where's the dad? Okay. See, what, if, you, if you go to It Takes a Village, you cut out one of the parents, typically is what's happening. And that's, I think that's what Hillary Rodham Clinton, when she does her village thing, is, you know, it's the whole community. Uh, father and mother, ah, who needs that? We just need a community. No, a father and mother is so important. So the question is, where's the dad? Of course, in this situation, the mother there, who may also be the dad, of course, she can't be because it's genetically impossible. Um, she's the parent and she's at work and there was nobody responsible for these minors at that time. And that's the thing. You may be at work but you better have that minor child being watched by somebody else. And you, you think, oh boy, you're 16, you'd be able to handle this? Uh-uh. That's not how it works. <laughs> um, uh, you earn that trust. Now, I, I appreciate what she said is that uh, uh, he will be punished if he's the one. She didn't say this, but I'll say it. If he was one of these kids that did this, you know, he will be punished, and that's good for her. Um, and she raises a good point. Back to the, if the village is corrupt, uh, how can it take a village? And so she raises that point is, is uh Older people, adults, are luring these kids into this type of behavior, and these kids are following it. And at that type of situation, you got to, as a parent, you got to put the hammer down harder, put more restrictions on, take away liberties, and that kid gets to decide what they're going to do. If you're not doing that, if you are doing that, and the kid still misbehaves, let them face the consequences. That's where our community, our society, comes down and says, no, this is behavior that's not acceptable, you make them an example and say, don't do this. And here's the consequences of that. We don't have this situation where the people, citizens are filing complaints and the police are ignoring them or the county prosecutor. And I have talked to police officers. I'm not going to charge this pr situation because the county prosecutor is going to do nothing. And I, said, and I tell that officer, make that county uh, prosecutor, that city prosecutor, do nothing. Put it on them, not on yourself. Okay, make them make that decision. But right now, you're the one stopping uh, the right thing from happening. Okay, now, we're to love justice. We're also to love mercy. And people can change. And it's typically a situation where something is wrong, where people wake up and say, oh boy, that's bad. 
this is a bad situation, they get enlightened, they change their behavior. Uh, but we need to do it right. Um, it, yeah, we do judge people, as she said, and uh, they are hoodlums. In our media, they're glorifying this gang behavior, they're at fault with that, but if they're not the ones actually doing the behavior, you can't hold them accountable. They have freedom of speech, they can promote that stuff all they want, there needs to be a stronger voice saying, no, this isn't good, we're left holding the results of that, but we gotta step up and hold the results of that and hold it accountable and be a family uh, that's working uh, towards this good behavior. Okay, do we have another video? Yeah, I got one video left on this. I do? No, that, that was it. All right, so next Wednesday, a lot more video. We're going to tie this all in to what's going on in St. Paul with Greg Copeland. This will be Wednesday night show um, on Inside Insight, uh, where we will be talking about not only property rights, this uh, this beating that took place, and um, uh, also the education system in St. Paul. Greg Copeland will be on the show. We're going to tie all these in, in together and showing how it's affecting things. And, of course, the biggest piece is when we take out the moral foundation, we don't teach values uh, to our children, uh, and our, our laws are left that we can't do that, we can't teach that there's a, there's a God that holds people accountable, um, and what do you expect, you know? And, of course, that's because, there's another reason that's happening is because of this national education program that's going out there that's trying to take God out of everything, where now you are forced with your property tax money, uh, there's no freedom of association, and you're forced out of the picture. Uh, you have to pay money to people that aren't uh, respecting your values, and freedom of association is lost. Um, I, um, so are these parents taking their kids to church? Um, and because of all the other things, global warming, various other topics the schools are teaching, um, you know, they're not getting on the right things that they need to be. Okay, uh, they, they're not teaching on the things they should be teaching. So that lady that was holding the mic was an interesting story there because the press was to the right of her, and what she was doing, this is Leslie McMurray, head of the District Community Council, she was putting herself in the way of the videos. And uh, one person who spoke there, I think Greg Copeland, he tried to move the mic forward so the press could take a picture without her being in the way and uh, she put her foot on the base so it wouldn't be moved and then she kept getting in front uh, of people <laughs> so it was a, it was just you know uh, it's just a bad situation uh, that was taking place there a lot of control going on okay uh, is that really almost all the time we have left oh my goodness Okay, time has flown. Uh, if you have comments or questions, again, uh, feel free to call in 651-747-3838. And then also uh, speechless at gmail.com. Leave your comments and questions. And we're glad, you know, we'd love to hear what ideas you have for the show. And uh, we're trying to incorporate that, Common Core. Of course, some people have been wanting to know about that for a long time. Finally getting it done. Uh, it's been taking a while. Uh, so just on parental rights, the uh, disability uh, situation here in the last couple minutes, there's 15 critical issues with the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability. And you can go to parentalrights.org, go to that website, gather that information, and click on Convention of Rights with Persons with Disability. You'll find a spot there for 15 problems. And here's the big problem, one of them, and if we can get that graphic up here, the best interest of the child standard, number one, in Article 7, uh, Subdivision 2, provides courts and government agencies, rather than parents, the authority to decide what is best for children with disabilities. 
Okay, big problem. International legal scholar Geraldine Van Buren, who helped to draft the Convention on the Rights of the Child, which contains an identical standard, admits that this standard provides decision and policy makers with the authority to substitute their own decisions for either the child's or the parent's, pro providing it's based on considerations of the best interest of the child. And you need to understand this. The best interest of the child is the best interest of the state. So if the state says this is going to cost us too much money, we're not going to do it. Uh, if, if they can come up with whatever reason. So you as a parent no longer participate in the best interest decision. And not only that, the best interest of the child standard is going to be decided by the United Nations, not by the state of Minnesota. So you have countries like the Muslim countries telling you what's in the best interest of your child. And if it's anything like what's going on in the Egyptian church, the Coptic church, Coptic Christians, Egyptian Christians, they're taking away their right to liberties. Over 37 churches have burned down and, uh, recently. You don't want somebody with not your beliefs deciding what's best for your children. Number one issue. All right. Remember, if you don't stand up for other people's liberties, who's going to stand up for yours? And good men don't do nothing. God bless. Have a great week. The days go by like the forest sets on fire And the wind takes the kite as the firefly brings the light Sets on fire